Hello, everybody. Welcome to What is Truth. This is episode 101, which is actually that's the, in the Kabbalah, that's the gematric value of Michael. So hopefully we can honor that in our little presentation today of What is Truth. The question that was asked of Jesus Christ by Pontius Pilate, to which Jesus Christ said nothing. And I'm John Barnwell. I'm here north of the city of Detroit, Detroit, the Straits. And I'm here with the pastor, David William Perry, in the city of London and merry old England. And we're going to see if we can further enhance our our cathedral of logic here and, and try to create a worthwhile edifice for uh, being able to have an analogical relationship to the world of the arts and sciences and religion. And that's something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. I was digging around, thinking about what to talk about today, and I started thinking about as I frequently do, Dionysius the Areopagite and the first bishop of Athens, and uh, the woman he's named with, Demaris. And so we might chat about some of that later on regarding that woman. She's interesting. But I, as I was looking around, I came across in my something I got a long time ago Ireland and the Foundations of Europe by a Benedict. Fitzpatrick. And this is an interesting association copy, because this is was a copy sent out to a literary editor by the publisher. And so this is the review copy itself. But it's nice because it uh, does a nice summary of certain aspects. So I'm going to share with you some of the content from this letter dated November 29th, 1927 which was issued soon after the publication of the book. And it says to the liter literary editor, we are sending you today for a review a copy of Ireland and the Foundations of Europe by Benedict Fitzpatrick, publication date November 18th, 1927. This volume, although complete in itself, climaxes the work of the author in establishing the true position occupied by Ireland in that period between the 6th and the 12th centuries, roughly over 500 years. The author's first work, Ireland and the Making of Britain, was, was widely reviewed both in this country, Great Britain, Ireland on the continent, and various British possessions, and was the subject of much controversy. The, in the main eyes, even in England, the comment was decidedly favorable. This new work, because of its broader scope, will elicit perhaps even greater comment. Ireland and the Foundations of Europe is based principally on material taken from widely scattered medieval manuscripts produced on the continent. It reveals a national movement and crusade in exterior lands without parallel and long recognized, even in the dim outline of hitherto known as the crowning glory of Ireland and probably all the Northern peoples. Were it not for the ruthless destruction of Ireland's medieval literature, the record of Ireland's ancient greatness would be more amazing than it is. Even as it stands in this volume, there will be many a voice raised in astonishment. Here, see medieval Ireland occupying the same position in relation to the peoples of the North, as did the older Greece to Mediterranean land. We see the Irish Peregrini leaving their stamp of culture and enlightenment at the very portals of Rome and Greece and Burgundy and Austrasia, to the very borders of Poland and Russia, into Germany, Switzerland, Gaul, and even in the last phase of the Irish apostolate into Russia, Bavaria, and into Iceland. This truly is a challenging work and one that will prove a great source of enlightenment to all interested in having true light shed upon history. As one revelation follows the other, 
a degree of interest is aroused that is closely akin to reading a brilliant piece of fiction. This volume is indeed evidence of the hackneyed phrase that truth is stranger than fiction. And then they go on to entreat them to write a review. And so there you have encapsulated very nicely the role of, of Ireland in the Christianizing of Europe amongst the pagan peoples, all over the Anglo-Saxons, the Vikings, and, and the Franks, and, and even having influence in Rome and in Athens. And so there, it's important to understand that there were great uh, monasteries in Ireland that had developed on their own. It was a, the Celtic Church. Was, a, was its own entity before uh, the Roman impulse. Of course, the, the church in England was much more accommodating to the formalism of Roman culture. And so it was incorporated through Athelred and the various uh, Anglo-Saxon kings into uh, British society. But Ireland maintained its own identity independent of Rome during uh, a very long period of time. And out of there, the, perhaps the leading light of, of what came forth out of there is uh, John Scotus Irigina, or John the Scot. Scot is like Scota, which is like, it's an old uh, Gaelic form for Ireland. So the Scotland is Scotland because some Irish people came across and, and created settlements in there. And so this that whole idea of Scott and Scota, of course, in the, in the lore of Ireland, as I've shown you before, and I won't start digging out books because that'll take up too much time, but Scota was said to be a daughter of Pharaoh. And she uh, was married to Miled, who led the Celtic migration from Spain into Ireland. Of course, there were numerous waves of migrations, and you can look at the Book of Conquest, and you can see all these various various peoples that are mentioned there in their lore. You know, the Firbolag and Partalan and and the Tuta de Danan and and all these interesting peoples. But Rudolf Steiner is is our principal uh, kind of hub of activity here, and so it's interesting you know, to note that Rudolf Steiner says that Atlantis. Uh, in, in the ancient past, that, that Ireland was a remnant of Atlantis. And so it had a different character than the other areas in Europe. And that there was an ancient mystery center centered in Atlantis that was founded by the initiate who came to be known much later as Scythianos. And he's one of the inspirations behind the Rosicrucian movement. But that this mystery center, Rudolf Steiner refers to it mystery centers a lecture cycle. And in there, he refers to this as a great mystery center, so that people would uh, migrate there from, from all over the place. Because in the ancient world, if you wanted to be initiated into a particular mystery, you would had to go where that was initiation was being held. And in this particular center, it was the center for the Jupiter mysteries. And so that's just a little few seed thoughts I, I like to throw out there to give people points to research. Pastor David, how are you there, brother? John, always very, very good to see you on our Sunday revels. Um, yeah, I've got something in my eye, but there we are. That's, that's how the cookie crumbles. Um, the nights are drawing in in this part of the world, so it's getting darker very, very quickly. I think at the end of the month, we go back, uh, we, we, we gain an hour because British summertime is coming to an end. And of course, we're looking forward to um, basically all souls in the church or Halloween, if you're outside the church, um, where we, we remember ancestors. So it's rather apposite that you're bringing all that up. Um, ancestors, the veil thins between this world and the others, and we share time with our ancestors over meals and uh, with prayers and, and, and so on. So it's, it's a rich time. It's a, I've always loved autumn. I love the fall, to use an Americanism, much more poetic. Uh, I, I love that Americanism. 
um, it, it's a, a magical time of, of shadows and pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns and wonderful foods and warm drinks. And so I've always loved this part of the of the year. Um, apart from that, yeah, I mean, one mustn't get too carried away with the Celtic Brotherhood idea because there wasn't one. Um, if you go back to the realm of tr at the time of tribes, they all hated each other. They all murdered each other. Let's not get too carried away. Um, and how British are the British? Well, um, my mother, uh, if you go back to her grandmother, is pure Irish. Um, my stepfather was Irish. Um, when I was sat in the middle of Haythrop University, as it was then, uh, some nuns came up to me telling me I had an Irish face. I didn't know how to answer that. They're right, curiously. I mean, my name, David William Parry, you can't get more Welsh than that, you know. Um, and I've got a Welsh stream to the family. How English are the English? How Anglo-Saxon are the Anglo-Saxons? We've got to be a bit careful. Um, you know, do do they feel real fraternity in Scotland and Ireland? No, they hate each other. They hate each other. Um, let's, I mean, let, you know, let's get to some truth here. Um, the Scots think the Irish are, are basically brain-dead redundants. Um, the Irish think the Scottish have forgotten proper Gaelic and don't know what they're talking about. So that's <laughs> that, that's intertribal relations there. Um, oh, uh, the, the Celtic Church in itself cannot be underrated. I mean, a great source of mysticism and a great underpinning of arts. Um, it would, in my view, be error an error to talk about the Church of England before Henry VIII, the Church of Rome in England before Henry VIII, uh, but certainly not the Church of England. Um, there was no autonomy. Uh, misses were delivered by Roman cardinals about what they wanted. If that wasn't done, armies used to turn up. Um, you know, they, they, well, let's not get carried away with too much romanticism. Um, and also in my last book, I mean, if you look really at the origins of Christianity in Anglo-Saxon lands, and of course they were separated into different kingdoms, um, there was no tribal unity. There was nothing like the nation state here. There were no nations. It was way before anybody thought in that, in that, in those terms, that didn't exist. Um, that comes a lot later. Were those terrible progressives listened to in those days no they weren't and it's a good job they were or we wouldn't have nations to argue about um are nations important things well certainly john stuart mill thought they were not exactly a goose stepping nazi um and there are real reasons for that so <clears throat> um what am i thinking yeah i'm i loved your post on ae i've been doing a lot of thinking about ae Curiously, over the last couple of weeks, I'm not sure why I was a was and am a huge admirer of his. Um, I'd forgotten what he'd looked like until your post on Facebook. This sort of chubby, baity fellow, because um, in my mind he's always this sort of I don't know, ethereal, mystical type, coming up with spect spectacular poetries and paintings, drawings. But of course, he's this sort of the baity man of letters who likes having a pint or two in various political circles. That's very Irish. Um, you know, yeah, it, it's unwise, I think, to to think, you know, that's Ireland, that's England. Because um, it just doesn't work like that, really. I mean, in terms of representation, uh, certainly the Irish of Northern Ireland, of course, there's a republic. That's that stands its own ground as a sovereign state. So if you're talking about a united Ireland, there isn't one. Uh, was there ever one? Doubtful. Because uh, you're looking again at tribes, different regions at war with each other. Um, that's not to say the English should have stormed in there. Of course they shouldn't. But as I say, you know, I'm always working upon the premise that our ancestors were bastards. Therefore, that's what happened. Um, not good, but that's what happened. Um, yeah, what is Ireland? A land of saints and scholars. Uh, absolutely no, no doubt about that. One of my specialities is actually Anglo-Irish literature, nearly the forgotten category nowadays.
because let's face it, uh, Oscar Wilde and his likes were Anglo-Irish. They weren't purely Irish. If you'd have asked them, no, let's not hear them, what they've got to say. Well, I like asking people what they've got to say. They would have said very clearly Anglo-Irish. Um, they felt they embodied the best qualities of both peoples, and they felt strangely and rather smugly superior. Um, and that in itself is an interesting category, rather like Anglo-Indians. You're not allowed to mention that anymore. But I like talking to Anglo-Indians. I know, too, personally, they're very proud of it. And again, they rather see themselves as superior, not cringing inferiors. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it used to be Irish literature, Anglo-Irish literature used to be one of my fields of research. And, you know, the, the divisions in that are absolutely extraordinary. From traditionalists like W.B. Yeats, who can say that he wasn't a master poet? Nobody. But we can also say, of course, he was the founder of the Irish Fascist Party, which mustn't be forgotten. And also he was a nationalist in the sense that we don't like nowadays, not the sense we do, in the sense we don't. Um, against people like, I mean, God, you know, uh, James Joyce, who would have been this progressive modernist. Um, no, 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 none of that, that. None of that will work. Let's not listen to any of that. Uh, and you've got Seamus Heaney, if you're looking at this historical overview, as one of the so-called moderates in the middle. I love Seamus Heaney's poetry. Uh, Digging, I think, is one of my favourite poems. It was this sort of withering, withering man caught it, withered man caught in the middle of all of this, um, like a lot of the Irish writers. Um, so you don't get the romantic heights of the right you don't get the, the piercing depths of the progressive left. Uh, you get these people stuck in the middle wondering where they should be going. Um, so, you know, when people come up with that sort of stuff, um, I always just think, yeah, it's good on the outside. We've got to be careful because, of course, there, were, there are still inflammatory points of dialogue in certain parts of the kingdoms. Um, and we need to be careful of that before we go any further. And certainly the one thing I will say that's political um, is despite the colour of recent British politicians, the peace process was working incredibly well until now when everything is going wrong under that silly woman. Apart from that, how are you, John? Well, actually... Uh... In this uh, Benedict Fitzpatrick book, uh, he makes a very similar point. And that's that because of the tribalism, it was so powerful of an influence in Ireland, it held it back from, from getting pulled into the Roman system. And because, uh, you know, they, they when have they ever got a lot? I mean, they're all, all these different clans in Ireland had their own uh, work and their own agendas. And yeah, you had, you had uh, Tara, you know, with the seat of the high king, but there was a, that was a contentious uh, role at best, uh, unless you were a, such a substantial individual like Brian Baru that everybody would somewhat unquestionably accept your authority. And so you have that kind of a, an impulse that's going on there. But it the, just kind of makes the point of that the, the, uh, the mystery center in Ireland, that they were aware of the mystery of Golgotha clairvoyantly while it was occurring. That they, no, they noticed that it had changed the way things were on earth here, uh, which is a very intriguing concept. In fact, even William Butler Yeats, who you made mention to, he, he relates the old uh, wives' tale about Fergus the Druid observing the crucifixion clairvoyantly. And so you have this wonderful heritage that's outlined by uh, Evans Wentz and Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. I happen to run across my old copy here but uh, it's not the lovely first edition I used to have in, in green cloth with uh, 
all the symbols uh, embossed on the spine. But that's okay because uh, it's a book that I hung out with for many years and it's wonderful uh, that, that uh, traveling around Ireland and gathering the folklore from the various regions of the country. I mean, it's uh, quite a testimony to uh, that whole tribal culture impulse. But Britain nonetheless did enter into the realm of having a central ruling figure uh, more in a more dominant way uh, than in Ireland. But the, of course, the greatest figure that, that to come out of there, perhaps scholarly, is, is that John, uh, Johann uh, Scotus Irigina, who was the, the scholar in the court of, of uh, Charles the Bald, who translated the writings of Dionysius the Areopagite out of the Greek into Latin because they had been presented to the court, uh, the Carolingian court in France by Michael the Stammerer, the, the uh, ruler, the emperor of the Eastern Empire over in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. But so you have this very rich uh, uh, crossover of, of the various streams of Christianity. One point of interesting convergence is the school at Chartres Cathedral, which was r really a, an interesting study in and of itself. And you have some of the great churchmen that, that taught there and wrote. And so we have uh, a lot of, uh, contributions from that school. Uh, one of the most interesting figures there being Alana Sabinsulus. But so that there's this intermingling of, of these Christian impulses that's so strong. And, uh, but I was looking into Dionysius the Iapagite and in scripture and, and he's mentioned and that's in the uh, Acts of the Apostles or where is that? Uh, 17, chapter 17, verse 34, uh, where he, uh, Dionysius is mentioned along with a uh, woman, Demaris. She's quite a controversial figure because they really don't, they just say she was there, you know, they, okay, well, why would they, why would they mention her? And there's, there's been just uh, so much opinion and study done as to, to try and solve who this woman was, of course, the the ready association one would have. Well, she was probably an influential figure, being that she was uh, in the in the Areopagus. That that's a you know that's like being right in the hub of high society in Athens, and and in this particular uh, area around uh, Dionysius, who was a leader of the Areopagus. Uh, to have a woman there would infer that she was highly educated. Uh, that she probably came from a prominent family. There's been a recent study uh, done showing that there's attestations of, of that particular name amongst the, the Spartan uh, community. So she could very well have been from one of the influential families of Sparta. Uh, so it, it's quite fascinating. But uh, when you get into understanding that there were these women that, that would be around uh, the, the men when they're studying their uh, philosophic works and all that, and there were women that are, were uh, fluent to be able to, to, you know, they could hang out with them, that literally, you know, that they, that they were able to contribute to this. I mean, you have the classic example in, in the dialogues of Plato of, of the teacher of uh, one of the teachers of, of Socrates being Diotiba. And she was a, a very profound figure. In fact, the, uh, the, the banquet or symposium, as it's sometimes called, it, it focuses on Diotiba and, and the doctrines that were received by Socrates from her. And so there's this very uh, developed uh, female wisdom stream that, that's 
a fascinating area of study, but uh, well worth looking into. Yeah, uh, to finish up, I think a point I, I didn't define well enough a minute ago. I mean, certainly the origins of Christianity in this country are probably Orthodox, Orthodox Christian as opposed to Catholic. Um, and certainly it's unwise. You know, there, there are certain myths in our time that don't be a close historical uh, examination. I mean, one of them being that nobody ever moved and nobody knew any other parts of the world. Well, King Harold, Harold Godwinson, was probably a practicing Orthodox. And his daughter, Githia, probably got married uh, to a Russian in Kiev. Um, so, you know, people did move about. There were these international co uh, connections. It's just simply wrong to say that nothing ever happened. Rather like the myth that women had no power and no voice before our modern times. With the deepest respect to my American friends, that may have been true in a country with such Puritan origins. That certainly was not true across Europe. Um, how do I prove that? Elizabeth the First. Um, no, she wasn't a puppet queen. She was the sovereign. Um, she was the fairy queen. There were people writing poems about her and a ruthless sovereign as well. Uh, you know, a Queen Victoria. There are all, there always been, admittedly, they tended to be women of the higher classes or clergy. Um, the higher classes could do whatever they wanted because that's just Europe. God bless Europe. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the way to escape uh, domestic drudgery was to enter the church. And therefore, there were no limits. Uh, technically, you could be a scholar. You could be a scholar S, uh, which would be not really forbidden. It was just, you know, if you're living in a, a medieval village or a village before that, there are no resources for you to become a scholar. The end. There are no resources for anybody to become a scholar. And the local feudal lord isn't going to build a library or a school to help you out. You know, so we, we, again, we, we need a historical imagination here. Um, were they very few and far between? Yes. Scholars, rather like the modern world, were very few and far between. Um, there were lots of people playing at things, but that's not it. You know, I mean, we, uh, John. Well, if you if you read into uh, the book I just referred to, uh, Benedict Fitzpatrick, he talks about that in the in that five hundred year period that the kind of culture that was going on in Ireland was that they had monasteries there with extensive libraries of, of the Greek and Latin sources. And uh, these, of course, the, uh, a lot of these libraries were ravaged by the Vikings. And then the, when the English came in, there was a lot of disruption of that. But within that milieu, it was known that even a, an ordinary farmer would be able to read Latin and Greek, because they would go to this, these great schools at, that were established in, in these Celtic church centers. And so you have, like, for example, uh, as I, I like to mention out of there, uh, Johannes Scotus Herogena, Bertrand Russell dubbed him the most, and I quote, the most astonishing person of the ninth century, end quote. So you you can't produce an individual like that without those resources that David's referring to here. And it's really true. That's part of the problem that, that some people have regarding the authorship of Shakespeare. Well, obviously, uh, you know, he's very well read because you couldn't write all these historical plays and all that and have them fly uh, amongst the, the classes that would be familiar with their the content, you know, familiar with the history. You know, you you had to really uh, pull it off, and so they would argue, well, you know, he couldn't have done it because there was a in his home in Strat Stratford there was just a, uh, in the inventory that was uh, inherited by his daughter there was just like I think two books or something like 
that. So it's like they consider it to be ludicrous to think. But not knowing that even today you have this, this, this idea of sequestering books in private clubs and on great estates. And you always see like in Downton Abbey, you go in and that fantastic library. Forget the show. I want to go look at the books, you know, see what you got in there, you know. So it's like that's that's how people would gain access. If you if you got under the tutelage of of one of the great houses, that would give you access to the resources within the library and you would be able to, you know, become uh, educated through that means. And so it's very interesting to study how the the whole milieu developed uh, in in these types of uh, situations some of which uh, are inaccessible uh, it, that's an important aspect of it because there's private clubs they have books that you don't know you don't you never even heard of you know? and then if you don't belong to the club or you're not invited there you're not going to see them you know but then there's there's some nice uh Things that arose, the, the English Text Society, for example, they did, they did uh, some important publications uh, regarding early uh, Saxon writings and all of that. I have a few of them around here, but I, they're not pulled out because I had I in no mind thought that I would uh, mention them. But nonetheless, uh, the Halkett Society and uh, all these various literary societies, we used to get these old books that would be published in a limited run, you know, 50 copies, whatever, in white vellum of, uh, you know, the works by uh, Payne Knight and all these individuals trying to, to discern the meaning of symbols. And, and all these interesting publications. Uh, that, there was a book that went across my desk on, uh, on uh, gargoyles, uh, understanding gargoyles by by a guy named uh, Canon Fadge. And I, I have every so often, every year or two, uh, I'll, I'll do a search online. I find no mention of this book or this individual. I have yet to find it online. So there are things that are so obscure that even Google doesn't know about it. <laughs> I think you've just committed modern blasphemy by saying Google doesn't know about certain things. Um, I'm totally jealous, by the way, of the fairy faith in Celtic countries. I used to have a copy, only a paperback. It got lifted from my collection many years ago. I've got to get it back. And God bless the person that lifted it from me. Um, oh, Downton Abbey and Bridgerton or other modern fairy tales. Um, oh, I, why... <laughs> Old British actors trying to cash in on the pig ignorance of modern audiences regarding history. Um, Dame Dame What's Her Face said something on the, one of the, the beginning of the flagship episode of one of the series recently. She I, she spent some time with a man in Spain. No, you wouldn't have done love. And are you talking about an extramarital affair? Get it out. Get it out. You mean no? No, you wouldn't have done. Because there'd have been all this clash of money going on, and there'd been there'd have been social prohibition. No, you wouldn't have done. Um, the end. And if you had have done, you'd have been denounced as a whore, and someone would have tried to take your money. The end. Um, we forget the the beautiful rigors of the class system, um, and its ruthless dynamics. None of which have gone away. Um, and in fact, they're getting stronger. Yeah, I get annoyed about that Shakespeare nonsense. I mean, we all know working class people can't read and write, let alone compose anything artistic. It must have been an aristocrat or a member of the upper middle classes. That really irritates me. Um, let me contextualise what I said a minute ago. Certainly there were great monastery libraries and there were great centres of mysticism. That was balanced against rigid social roles and rigid social hierarchies and rigid gender roles. Um, therefore, if you were to escape your class and your gender restriction, that was incredibly rare, even if you lived in a village or a, a hamlet very close to one of those places. 
but certainly they were centres of excellence and light and intelligence, which sometimes nearly beggars the present. And shame on us for that, because that's not what the scholars in those places wanted. We've got to remember the monasteries were centres of learning. They were the equivalent of modern universities as well as places of prayer. Um, but to be able to escape that, if you're a peasant living in a village, uh, uh, even a couple of miles away, it was highly unlikely, even if it, that was your choice, that you'd have been able to extricate yourself from family ties, uh, village rubrics, not only to get to one of these places, but then convince the monks and the authorities that you should be in one of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So are they there? Yes, but they're also not there for the, for the oi polloi. You know, the great shame is that the great scholars of that time didn't really feel the need to explain what they were doing to people outside of those places. And therefore, you end up with medieval superstition. Uh, the likes of which has never existed before, but is probably going to exist again if I look at half of the programmes on Gaia TV. Um, it's all coming back with a vengeance. Um, uh, un unverified nonsense, uh, fantasy masquerading as reality, nobody checking sources. I mean, it's all on the way back. Um, so that's a deep worry because nobody wants serious scholarship at the moment. And there is no equivalent to the monasteries, stroke universities as they were then. Um, gosh, where do I go with all of that? Uh, certainly in terms of Shakespeare, I mean, he had a Welsh schoolmaster. Um, and of course, there would have been a village cleric who would have had books. Were there, to balance that and define that a little further, were there local scholars? There wouldn't have been teachers. Um, or if they were, as in Shakespeare's case, you were lucky that someone like that actually was in the village because they wanted payment. They wanted to be paid for their skills, quite rightly. Therefore, if your village couldn't support that, if they couldn't support the local scribe, the local man of letters, the man of letters would move on to somewhere that did or could. Um, why not? You know, people with skills and talents that shouldn't be on their knees, which is what basically the medievals thought they should be because of the serf system, because of their rigid, terrible view of the different classes and the nearly the complete lack of mobility between the classes. Uh, something that's making a, uh, something that's resurfacing here at the minute. Um, so yeah, I, you know, would Shakespeare have had access to the local priest's library, probably. And as I say, he did have a, a schoolmaster, which was rare, but, but fascinating. Um, surely someone of peasant origins can't write plays like that. Um, when I read Shakespeare, um, anyone reading a play should read a, read a play differently from a novel, or you're not reading a play. Um, read it as a play, read it as a script, not as a novel. And all I can see are the busy hands I'm not only a desperate actor, uh, but an incredibly worried impresario. Um, the Winter's Tale being the best example I can think of. The end of The Winter's Tale is awful. I mean, it's still a work of genius. Hey, it's Shakespeare, yeah. But my God, so has the woman been murdered or not? Has she come back to life or not? Oh, it's a statue. No, it's not. It's your wife. This is awful. I mean, it wouldn't make the Twilight Zone nowadays. You know, and uh, some of the worst productions I've seen were actually at the Modern Globe, where they didn't know what to do with the material either. But, you know, what are we meant to see there? You you see a busy director, a busy actor, experimenting with the script. He did it all the time. Therefore, he, he didn't get to the stage with that particular play. Oh, 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 you know, the ending he really wanted. He used to experiment with different ends. He used to experiment with uh, a middle. You know, the middle ground of plays a great deal. He, he tended not to tinker around with openings. I mean, he had the opening very clearly in his mind, apparently. Well, you know, the script tends to read like that mostly. But, you know, he, he wants to entertain an audience, not just instruct them. In Shakespeare's case, there was an educative function. I mean, there were all sorts of rumours that he was a hermeticist, a practicing hermeticist. 
um, at the very least a Platonist, which he would have got through his schoolmaster, um, as well as the local priest, because that was the dominant time of English Platonism, Neoplatonism. Um, I toy with the idea of Hermeticist, I must admit. And certainly you're on the verge of the English Renaissance. Um, you know, it's already happened on Europe. You've got to remember, you've got this big continent and then you've got an island. It's like China and Japan. So everything happens in China and then it gets to Japan. So everything happens in Europe, then it gets to Great Britain, it gets to England. Yeah. Um, and the uniqueness isn't that the, the originality. It, it's not original. It's already happened on the big landmass. The originality comes from the different type of consciousness, the different type of, of imagination that's employed on those materials that, that give it a new life. You know, in Japan, in sorry, in China, there's nothing like kabuki theatre, um, with its incredibly delicate and evolved sense of aesthetics. Every single move has a, a meaning, a semiotic. Uh, there's nothing like that in China, and yet there's no Shakespeare in in Europe or across Europe. There simply can't be. They've held whole symposiums in Moscow about why that hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened, and it didn't happen. And there are sociological and cultural reasons why it couldn't. Uh, you know, the uniqueness of the islanders when it comes to dealing with certain types of artistry and materials. I mean, everybody thinks of, of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, if rumour on the street has it correctly, he hated that play. By the way, I hate it too. <clears throat> you know, two soporific adolescents that don't care who they crush. They're going to get their way. Oh, God. That boy needs a slap and that woman needs to be told to get a grip. Um, you know, and he's on drugs, let's face it. You know, he took a prophylactic. It means he took a drug. So, you know, <laughs> you know the awful uh, prince, the local prince. Can you remember what you're meant to be doing, please, and bring some order and you know, into the chaos of your surroundings? Don't you think you're letting the side down, prince? Um, you know, and I'm on the side of Rosalind. You know, what was it? Romeo loved Rosalind. He'd have done anything for Rosalind. Then came Juliet. What about poor Rosalind? What a total bastard. Um, so now, I mean, that play, to my reading, um, is one basically of the first love of life, that sort of adolescent crush that you get. If it's seen in that way, it becomes a work of genuinely eternal genius. Uh, and how do we get to that? Because if you compare it to Antony and Cleopatra, which, to my mind, again, seems to be the play about mature love. And of course, they nearly destroy the planet. Um, their love destroys, they nearly destroys the Roman Empire and everyone surrounding them. But, you know, they do it because of love. I think you're looking at, you know, an incredible depth of spirit and psychology and real humanity, what we are our best and what we are our worst. Uh, yeah, I mean, was it Francis Bacon who wrote the, <laughs> it needed to be a savant to write the historical plays. Why? Because he's a knob, because he's got a title. Sod off. Did you know anything? Do you know anything, Francis, about plays? Have you ever put one on? Do you know how difficult it is to get an audience? Do you know you've got to keep them one over or they walk off and want their money back? Has that ever crossed your aristocratic mind? Uh, you know, no, and it didn't. It didn't. And also the fact uh, Shakespeare co-authors all the time. He's working on other manuscripts with other people all the time. He takes advice about what works and what doesn't work. There's enough material left to verify all of that. Uh, you know, my favourite play is The Tempest. I promise to finish after this, John, which is the last play he wrote on his own. <clears throat> I tend to say for shorthand, excuse me, it's the last Shakespeare play by which I mean he wrote that without a collaborator, um, without taking advice from anybody else. For me, that's the piece de resistance, because not only is it a defence of the free mind, um, what's the magic of Prospero if you look very deeply? Is he Renaissance magus capable of influencing the stars? Yes, he is, but let's look a bit more deeply. Uh, the free mind, free scholarship, which can work marvels if it's allowed to do its work. That is a powerful piece of writing, which nearly all of the political authorities in England were deeply suspicious of at the time, and they didn't like it at all, because it was clearly aimed at them. 
Um, no, I mean, a, a very great man, a busy actor, sort of melting director. Hey, you've got to pay your actors. You've got to pay your actors or there's trouble. You know, and right, what's, what's the other great innovation? Introducing the interval, um, because that really didn't exist before then. Why did Shakespeare do that? Because you've got all these taverners saying, look, look, Bill, I need to sell beer and I need to sell some food. They're all set in that theatre for hours on end. So all of a sudden, this magical move of an interval is actually introduced into Elizabethan drama. So everyone can do trade and get and get a pie eye during the intermission. And of course, that itself begs other things like what do you do during an intermission? Nowadays, of course, you just get told to sod off to the bar. You know, but it, Shakespeare felt that that was somehow wrong. So, of course, during a tragedy, he would have clowns on the stage. And during a tragedy, he'd have, you know, and vice versa and vice versa, you know, uh, tr clowns with tragedy and serious actors. When it came to the other materials, no, I see a very busy actor and theatrical at work in there, so I don't go for any of that at all. What do you think, John? Yes, there's a lot that comes to mind. Prospero, yeah, Dame uh, Frances Yates put forward uh, an opinion that, that Prospero was based on John Dee, the court astrologer. Queen Elizabeth, and uh, later influential in James I, too. Uh, he was the genius behind uh, the organization of the British Navy, and, and he's attributed. There's even a, a legendary account of that through magical powers, he was able to bring about a storm that caused the Spanish Armada which was much larger than the British fleet uh, to go into destruction. And thereby Queen Elizabeth I was able to overcome the onslaught of the Spaniards. So that's, that's an interesting little legend. Yeah, well, Rudolf Steiner makes the point. He says it, it's evident from the plays themselves that, and keep in mind, Rudolf Steiner was a playwright himself. He wrote his three mystery dramas. He edited Goethe and his scientific works, but Goethe was a playwright, ran a playhouse. Schiller was a playwright, ran a playhouse. Uh, and Rudolf Steiner himself said that it's, it's evident from the plays themselves that, that they were written by an actor because it's concerned with the development of characters and the activity of, of what's occurring on the stage. And it would be difficult to be able to have that kind of a perspective were you not involved in that whole milieu. And there's whole long uh, areas of script where it's basically the dialogue on stage is just something to pass some time until the next important dialogue comes up. And so they're up there saying these things. And, and you, if you get into Shakespearean scholarship, it's, it's basically a given amongst the better scholars that, yeah, this is just like kind of taking up some time to, to let the scene develop. And so that, you know, they're almost speaking, you know, rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb. It says borders on that it, in, in its insignificance to the central plot line. So that it's the that whole idea of portraying all the other activity in the room and all of that. Well, just a second here. And, uh, but yeah, my, my buddy, uh, Joe Visconti, who I occasionally have chats with on here, he, he is the uh, director of the American Shakespeare Theater here in the United States. And so, too, you could probably have an interesting uh, polemic, shall we say. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say only a scholar would come up with that, that it's a waste of time on the stage. Love, have you ever sold tickets to a play? Yeah, you know, it's a, they're wasting time from the central plot. Have you ever written a play or tried to stage a play? Please keep your trap shut. You know, uh, there are reasons. There are reasons why those things happen. 
um, you know, like like make believe language. I think American scholars are actually are very uh, uh, higher. They're better than British scholars on interpreting nonsense phrases by Shakespeare, like folder roll. Um, certainly in the American Academy, it was decided a long time ago that that was a synonym, uh, a phrasal verb like synonym for nonsense, you know, make believe. Um, apparently at Oxford and Cambridge, oh, they're still arguing whether it has cognitive value or not. Put on a play. Put on a play and you'll see what he's doing. It's that simple. You know, um, yeah, I mean, he, obviously he's been a huge influence on me. How could you not love big witty Shakespeare? You know, anyone that doesn't like him knows nothing about language and its beauty or the sadness of human life and its joy. Uh, they know nothing about magic. Um, certainly Macbeth. You can say it outside of a theatre. You can't say it in a theatre. So Macbeth, 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 because you're perfectly safe, provided you're not near the boards when it's said. Um, you know, I mean, there's a whole ritual at work in Macbeth if you're reading it from that angle. Um, and certainly King Lear, you know, the, the king that becomes a fool, You've got to look very, very carefully at the different depths and different levels that Shakespeare was working on. Personally, again, I see the sometimes it's heavy handed. But is that for me, you're looking at different types of mysteries. Uh, oh, was it written by an aristocrat or not? Yeah, 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 whatever. You know, how conscious is he that certain people in the audience will suddenly realise they're watching a ritual when they're watching Macbeth. Um, how many people will be aware that the king who becomes a fool has all these tarot associations at the very least? Um, and, you know, who exactly is the jester that says terrible things to the mad king? These are deep, pagan, philosophical, magical waters, all of which have a ritual basis. And, you know, Shakespeare, sometimes Shakespeare is almost getting you by the scrap of the neck and shaking you and saying, you know, can anyone in this audience see that? And you've got to remember that staging a play in those days, I mean, certainly, I mean, it's like staging anything on the fringe today. It's a nightmare. You know, but in those days, you had to gather the resources together. It would basically be the local knob, the local aristocrat or the local church. Uh, only they had the resources to actually put on a play, plays by definition, and not simply for one night, um, because people have spent weeks perfecting the roles and learning the lines, and it's how they make their money. So by definition, it's more than one night. So you need people with resources to be able to do that. There'd be no stage area unless you were in somebody's stately home and they'd had that type of area built into it or they could adapt one of the one of the great lounges one of the great halls for that purpose um and you know the the players needed to work as best they could with zero resources there were no state benefits there were no dolls there were no handouts unless you were lucky enough to have a patron of course in the end shakespeare did not at the beginning i mean it was that without the Earl of Southampton, arguably, as his most prominent patron, um, that most of it wouldn't have happened in the first place. I just think you know, the signs are very clear about what he's doing. The signs are not so clear about the depths. Um, so let, you know, let's look at a, a, um, an audience. If you look at the globe as it was in those days, right, so you get the higher tiers for the aristocrats and the clergy. Uh, and the lower tiers are for your plebs, the working people. Um, you know, and they would be what they call nowadays air seats. In other words, you're stood through the performance and you're gathered around that place that's, you know, demarcated as the stage area. You're actually stood next to the actors. You're at a slightly lower level, but you're stood next to them. And they've got to arrange you know, their, their own green room. They've got to arrange for costume changes. They've got to arrange for entries and exits. You know, where all the world's a stage and all the people, many players, they have their entries and their exits. Is that philosophical, deep philosophy? Yes, it's also the practicalities of a theatre guy. You know, what they did in those days where there was normally a curtain 
somebody had finished their part and they walked to the curtain and it would go back and then it would be drawn again and that was them out of the world of the play. I mean, you know, if anyone's looking at postmodernism, they need to look at Elizabethan drama and how they managed to use space and time in a very restricted area. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe one or two of the clerics, one or two of the scholars, if it was playing at Oxford, uh, maybe one or two of the scholars would have thought, oh, now that's odd. That reminds me of Giordano Bruno, or that reminds, uh, as a case in point, or that reminds me of so-and-so. You know, the transmission levels would have been very small. But the intriguing thing is they were there. They were there to begin with. You know, it's almost like he sees himself as putting leaven in the bread. You know, maybe, and who was he aiming at? I mean, clearly these plays are aimed at the working classes. Um, with their groats, have a groat, have a penny or two, Big Willie. You know, but he was aiming at them, the place he went out of his way. The king's men, his his troop, went out of their way to say, these are for the people. So again, you're looking at a deeply subversive character, actually, in our terms, doing deeply subversive things and managing to get away with it because he was an actor and a playwright. John? Well, yeah, there's, a, there's that other vantage point on the plays is that uh, that he was characterizing contemporary figures with his historical characters. And so he could say uh, some pretty dodgy things about Dudley, you know, by uh, putting it in the mouth of someone in one of his historical plays, for example. Yeah, you look at, at Shakespeare and it's almost unfathomable. If you go to his, his sonnets, which are unsurpassed, okay? Did, did you hear what I just said? They're unsurpassed, okay? I mean... Just two things quickly. Um, I remember at school, uh, and I this wasn't just my experience, when you get to the sonnets to Mr. X, clearly his boyfriend, where the teacher at the front suddenly looks embarrassed and says, I know, what was it? I know what it sounds like, but it's not. And then you go back to the text. It is, he is saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and we all had great fun watching them wriggle and squirm at the front of the class because they, they couldn't, they wouldn't dare go against the text. And it was very, very clear. Right, the poet I forgot, uh, the poet of the eye, the poet of Derek Jarman, that justifies your point. Um, clearly, Prospero is Dr. John D. Um, I can't remember the name of the film offhand. There's one film by Jarman where he has uh, uh, Dr. D and Elizabeth I. I think they're dancing along Brighton Beach. These two, I mean, what are they nowadays? They're magical fairy tale characters. You know, her in all of her pearls and ruffles and lace and fineries. And him as the great scholar, the magician, the wonder worker. And she, there was a line in that play, there's a line in that movie, forgive me, Jubilee, Jubilee, <clears throat> that's, that's, that for me just struck like a thunderbolt when I heard it. They're, they're serenading each other, they're dancing, and she says to him, paraphrasing, do you remember the time when you created celestial mechanics? And like, what? And of course I went to check that, and he did. Centuries ahead of time, Dr. D created what we would call celestial mechanics. How is that not magic? John, back to you. Yeah, you have John D's mathematical preface to uh, Euclid. And in there, he, he creates a whole... Uh, hierarchy of the various subjects that one might study and it basically you could say in a sense he he was instrumental in the creation of the modern university because he took all the various branches of study and showed how it all fit together and of course the symbol uh, is hieroglyphic monad which is like a symbol of of the planet Mercury with the crescent moon and then on a cross, and then there's that 
that uh, like the symbol of Aries at the bottom. And of course, that's the symbol that's that's represented the hieroglyphic monad in the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz by Johann Valentin Andreas. And Johann Valentin Andreas is interesting because he wrote those as a like a basically a late teenage around what 17, 16, 17 years old. And Rudolf Steiner says about the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which is one of the central documents of the Rosicrucian stream, that they were written under the inspiration of Christian Rosenkreutz himself. And that he, he says that it's obvious, uh, e even if you investigate the later writings of uh, Johann Valentin Andreas, later in life, he, he called it a ludubrium, like a joke, right? And But Rudolf Steiner said that uh, under the inspiration of Christian Rosenkreutz, that uh, Johann Valentin Andreas was capable was writing uh, a work that he wasn't even capable of uh, of interpreting. It was so there was so such a deep level of inspiration. But if you continue on with Rudolf Steiner's indications that were given regarding that type of inspiration, he also includes Shakespeare. And he says that uh, one of the reasons that there's this confusion between the authorship of the plays that involving uh, Francis Bacon, Lord Verulam, and William Shakespeare is that they were both under the inspiration of Christian Rosenkreutz and that they, they received that inspiration. Although in, in Bacon was a more materialized form. And then you have Johann Valentin Andreas and that uh, the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which is just wonderful uh, to read. Uh, there's a lovely translation in the Christian Rosenkreutz anthology by Carlo Pietzner, one of my old mentors from back in the day at the Institute. But yes, and there's other individuals that drew that inspiration. Jakob Bima, uh, you know, the, the playwright uh, uh, Jakob ba uh, Balda, poet uh, what a jesuit poet by the way you know and and so you you have it's interesting that, uh, because if you get into the idea of uh, spiritual economy that that when an individual achieves a certain level of attainment and initiation that they create astral and etheric vehicles are created that could be maintained in the spiritual world that uses as sources of inspiration, either in an incarnation or just to come into relationship like the, the, the doctrine of the Nirmanakaya, Sambhokakaya, and Dharmakaya. In the Buddhist tradition, they have that whole idea of the super, these super sensible vehicles as sources of inspiration. So that this, Rita Steiner indicates very clearly it's, that it's definitely a uh, within the realities of, of occultism. And so you have like, for example, the Nirmanakaya of the Buddha playing a prominent role in the Gospel of Luke. Rudolf Steiner makes mention of it, the, the angels singing in, in, at the birth of, of the baby Jesus, you know, that, that Rudolf Steiner indicates that that involves the Nirmanakaya or spiritual form of the uh, Buddha. So that that's, I mean, that's totally outside of the, the reach of most people to grasp. But I throw these out there. And like what I f frequently have to say is uh, a healthy suspension of disbelief can help one gain access to, to, to understanding the, these ideas, even if you only want to approach them as far as to understand what in the world I'm talking about. Whether or not you agree, it, it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, so much. Uh, because uh, as Rudolf Steiner said, just go out there and speak the truth and pe let people do whatever they will with it. You know, that's that's okay. And don't worry, because if if what you're saying isn't true, well, it won't have any life. So it'll it'll go into demise. As I as I as I once said, all truth uh, serves its own end. All else serves as compost, nurturing its growth. 
Well, that was a good quote. I'll have to say who that was in a minute. Um, <coughs> yeah, Atlantis, Atlantis, Atlantis. Um, I love going to Ireland. I haven't been there enough. Um, I remember years back going to the city of Cork in the county of Cork and being stuck. I probably said this little anecdote before. I don't know. Uh, there isn't as much sunshine in that part of the world as here, and here isn't exactly a drenched tropical paradise. But there was brilliant sunshine when I was going through it, and the mountains as you walked around the bay, as you drove around the bay, were turning rose-coloured and disappearing into the aether. Um, uh, a strange natural phenomenon that was so breathtakingly lovely, so breathtakingly beautiful, that cars were actually stopping, and that never happens in the modern world, to watch these these rose rose coloured mountains disappear. Um, I love the architecture; it's good, solid, you know, clean stone, uh, a pint of Guinness, um, the elixir of that part of the world. Yeah, but I don't see Atlantis, um, and I'll stand corrected. And Steiner isn't someone I'm going to argue with. I'll tell you where I do see it. I see it in Cornwall. Um, there's something different about that branch of England. I mean, they used to say they were going to England when anyone from Cornwall was making a trip into Anglo-Saxon lands. I don't think they do that anymore, or if they do, it's very rare, and it's amongst the elderly. But there's something odd and there's something different about Cornwall. It never really gets on with the rest of the country, the rest of England, let alone the Celts. Now, of course, that's something to do with the fact that Henry VIII sold so many Cornish people as slaves um, to some of the Arabic traders of the day. Um, that's something to do with that and anyone that would take them. You know, uh, Henry VIII, that wonderful human being, declared class war on Cornwall because they dared to actually speak against anything he wanted to, you know, certain things he wanted to do, which you didn't do. People forget that. You you didn't speak against a gentleman in those days, or there were consequences. Um, so slavery was rife in that part of the world, uh, and lots of people were taken, families were destroyed, communities were destroyed. So there's always been an angst and... Uh, dissonance between Cornwall and Devon, I will probably extend it that far, and the rest of the so-called English shires. Um, but as I say, there's a feeling, there's a feeling of something other. There's a feeling of something not now, something belonging to the past, uh, which is not only me that's noticed. I mean, uh, recently I was reading um, Ithel or Ithel. You can say it either way. I, I was taught Ithil, so let's say that. Uh, Ithil Colcahoon, um, the S British surrealist, I've got an Anglo-Indian, of course, um, the British surrealist painter and gifted writer. And it was reading, um, oh, what was it? The Stones, Walking Through the Stones, I can't remember. Stone Circle, can't remember. That I was rem reminded, of course, she was also a practicing occultist and a sensitive that I was reminded that she too, and many of the creatives of her time, felt Atlantis still impinged on Cornish soil, on Cornish lands. Um, there's something in the air. I'm going to say something weird and completely unverifiable. I'm sure I do often. The Living Stones. The Living Stones. Um, because it's palpable at times. You know, all these stories of, of, of pixies or piskies, as they call them down there. OK, who are they? Who are they and what is that? What are those stories meant to be exactly? And the fact they all come from other lands and they're not particularly pleasant. And they don't like the Cornish and don't get in their way. Um, you know, because it, they would claim it's something that was before the Cornish arrived there. And certainly certain people have said, well, there's a resonance between... Cornwall and the Basque territories, um, which of course still are claiming independence from Spain, and not only genetically, ethnically, and culturally, are separate from Spain. All of that has been verified. There is something of a similar nature uh, to the Cornish 
who, you know, if we're getting into this genetic splicing nonsense nowadays and an endless analysis that always seems to lead nowhere, um, you know, who are the Cornish and where are they from exactly? Because it's, they're not Anglo-Saxons particularly. Um, and their outlook is different. Um, Basque territory is known for witchcraft. Cornwall is known for witchcraft. And I don't mean the delicate types of nature worship, Platonism, that I'm talking about. I mean witchcraft, witchcraft. Um, it's still got that reputation. It's still unwise to upset the local wise woman in that part of the world. Um, was it Cecil Wilkinson? I can't remember his name offhand. Uh, a modern witch, a modern Cornish witch. Uh, he was a schoolboy. I'll check that name in a minute. Uh, on his way to school when the local thugs, you know, a pint or two admittedly, were literally beating an old woman to the ground. Uh, this is this you know this isn't too long ago, and uh, uh, Cecil put his body between the old woman and these louts, who decided they couldn't do anything to him because he was a Christian. Um, so they can beat an old woman senseless. Oh, that's okay, you know. And apparently she said to Cecil, "Right, you better come round in the evening," and taught him the secrets of witchcraft. Um. And remember, that's not in the way I'm using that term. It's in a much darker and much more ancient way, or if there's anything more ancient than Platonism. Um, you know, there's something different to the atmosphere. There's something different to the culture and the residues of what helped form that culture. If anybody's looking for Atlantis and um, the remnants of a lost continent, my money is going there as opposed to Ireland. But that's just me. What do you make of all that, then, John? Well, uh, Sir Philip Sidney, the Elizabethan, in his defense of Posey, uh, circa 1580 to 1583, he said in Wales, the true remnant of the ancient Britons. And so uh, that's his opinion of it. But this is in a, a lovely book that I still have from many years ago. It's uh, Spencer and the Table Around by Charles Milliken. And it's a study of Edmund Spencer, the author, Elizabethan author of The Fairy Queen, which plays into what you're discussing regarding that whole idea to the magical kingdom of fairy and, and all the, the pixies and the elves and all of these things that uh, modern people aren't, aren't as inclined to believe, but I've seen some, you know, so. I won't tell. And there you have the good old Winchester. Uh, let's see there. It's uh, getting over the weird perspective on this camera. See if I like it. There. That's the Winchester Arthurian table that's mounted on the wall at, at the. Winchester. And so you have that 12 fold archetype, uh, which is like the 12 apostles, and that that's very much the whole idea of that uh, cosmology that, that you find embedded within esoteric Christianity. There's always a, there's always these 12 and then, and then the seven and, and the way in which they inter interact, you, you can come to a much deeper understanding of it than studying the work of Rudolf Steiner. But uh, that being said, we're moving along here, and I don't want to be amiss and, and remind you that we have this distinguished author here sharing his wisdom. That's David Perry, who actually has a book on a Shakespearean study akin to what he's discussing here. The grammar of witchcraft and uh it's not a grimoire so it's not a how-to like that that fellow was able to get from that old woman and here's his second book that's uh shakespearean uh, shakespearean s poetry caliban's redemption and his major work is mount athos inside me essays on religion swedenborg and the arts 
and it's edited by the very talented Daniela Hadia Induced. And those are all available on Amazon, as is the volume by Daniela Hadi Irundus, the on the philosophy of education towards an anthroposophical view, which takes a great many threads of contemporary understanding and tries to show how they might relate to the, the work that was created uh, through mostly through Waldorf education, but through the anthroposophical perspective. And it's a very unique study in that regard because he's so well read in uh, modernist and postmodernist authors. So to be able to contextualize Rudolf Steiner within that kind of a milieu is extremely unique. And uh, so all those are available on Amazon. In fact, you can download a free digital copy of Daniela's On the Philosophy of Education. And uh, so that's definitely worth looking for. And for myself, I have two books. The Arcana of the Grail Angel is my first book, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner, of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order. Uh, with the text and diagrams of the forward by my best buddy from American Intelligence Media, Douglas Gabriel. And it has this whole series of diagrams based on the diagrams of Baron for Pfeiffer, in addition to a great many more that I created myself. And I created even more for my second volume, which is Arcana of Light on the Path, Star Wisdom of the Tarot and Light on the Path. And I show the coding system of Esoteric Christian Stream, again, with the, all of the diagrams that were in the previous book, plus a great many more. And so uh, in there is laid out the cosmology of Rudolf Steiner and uh, how it pertains to the mysteries of Christian occultism, which is the central mystery of occultism, period. And in fact, if they don't have that type of content, understanding the qualities of time, they haven't gotten very far along in trying to unlock those mysteries. And so, uh, but my first volume, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, is temporarily out of print, so I'm working on uh, getting it back in print. I was just conferring with, with James Stewart uh, regarding that uh, just this morning. Uh, James Stewart of the Rudolf Steiner Archive, uh, who created that, put 40 years worth of work in there. But uh, you can get my second volume still. Uh, that's on Amazon. And you can order it from Amazon. I mean, not on Amazon, on, on uh, eBay. All too much to remember here. That's available on eBay directly from me. Uh, if you're outside the US, you can contact me directly through the academia link that's down below on here on, uh, on the podcast, or you can contact me through private message on Facebook. And if you want to buy us a cup of coffee for our efforts, it's greatly appreciated. No amount's too small. That's paypal.me forward slash dperry777 for Pastor David. And for myself, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888 And please click like, share this, get it out there. We have, a, we have one of the most successful minute podcasts just uh, we managed to get just a, a couple hundred or so people watching, but that's okay. I'm more into quality. And to be perfectly honest, it's we're not the easiest podcast to follow, but uh, sometimes we're one of the more fun ones, perhaps. But uh, trying to think, yes, and there's also a, I cannot forget this if I could find it. Where did I put it? I got all this going on here. And I, but I want to, uh, where, I keep adding things here, that this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyler and Douglas and Vadim and Vivian and Tim and Neil and the 
great many more people, including Ray and Whitney and James and Marilyn, and so many people over the years who either donated or purchased one of my books. But uh, if you do donate, I can include you in my email and I send out things regularly via email. Uh, but I think I've covered most of everything regarding all of that. If there's something I left out, please correct. I think you always do a very fine job in all of that, actually. Um, yeah, I, I know we're, we're aiming at quality, not quantity, but a bit more quantity wouldn't hurt. Um, you know, why is everyone so resistant about having an intelligent conversation nowadays? I mean, we both bent over backwards to include everybody in our discussions. It's not just two old goats chewing on books. You know, there, there's a lot more going on than that here. Um Right, the name of the uh, my 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 partner reminded me the name of the chap was Cecil Williamson. Now he died, according to my uh, memory, sometime in the nineteen nineties. Can't remember offhand. So you know, is Cornish witchcraft alive and well? Yes, it is. And remember, you're not talking about the delightful types of pagan nature worship that I'm enamoured by. You know, a sort of Greek. Ancient Greek, oh my God, what a perfect mountain. Oh, the colour of the sea. So you're not talking about that sort of stuff. You're talking about alternative types of knowledge, at the very least, that claim incredible powers can be got through via the manipulation of herbs and bones, just to make a start. Um, you know, if someone died in the 1990s and was known as a practicing witch, I mean, lots of people in this country have heard of Gerald Gardner. Um, and uh, right, Doreen Valiente, right? So they basically, their mother, father, and mother of Wicca. And um, the big argument here is how is it witchcraft or is it Wicca? Which I think is actually a valid argument. I mean, certainly. Uncle Gerald, you know, old colonial officer, liked a good pink gin at the end of the evening. So, and that's not to put him down. Uh, I, I'm, I'm incredibly interested in Gerald Garner. But we again, we mustn't get too carried away. I mean, he claims that part of his transmission came from a coven, he, a coven of witches that were operative in the New Forest. Well... Um, I grew up in Fareham in Hampshire, which isn't too far from the New Forest. Um, is it beautiful? Yes. Was something going on? Yes. Was it becloaked, becloaked old ladies throwing pentagrams around? Highly unlikely. I mean, what seems to have been the case, you know, and it sort of impinged upon our lives. I mean, my mother was involved in one of those weird conversations many years back of if she ever wanted to come along to a meeting i mean she never did you know what what you know the normal hampshire attitude is right let's have another drink before we go anywhere then you end up not going anywhere um it would have been a collection of old ladies probably saying things like celtic prayers in other words the type of prayers that people would have said before the roman church was in England uh, before maybe the Anglo-Saxons were in England, you know, and they'd have used saints' names. Um, they'd have used ancient names for the gods, um, and it would have been very informal. You know, they turn up, they say a few prayers, maybe they have a cup of tea and they go home. Now, certain po people are not being rude, and I'm absolutely sure that they know much more about these things than I do. But to claim it's this fully developed postmodern, or at least sort of, you know, medieval, I mean, how long is this cover actually meant to have survived? You know, this sort of uh, Margaret Atwood, um, you know, very, 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 very odd. Um, and I, I'm sure it was nothing like that. So, you know, Wicca, which of course is simply the Anglo-Saxon word for wise, um, which wise, you know, so the wise person of the village. 
is that witchcraft or not? Um, lots of people say not. Some people say it is. Uh, that to me is um, an attempt to a modern attempt, almost a postmodern attempt to get ecology into spirituality. That's my I'm toying with that view at the minute. Um, whereas William, sorry, Cecil Williamson, I've got a block about that name. I don't know why. That is not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about hereditary witchcraft, apparently, that's passed down through families um, and all the skills and all the knowledge that go along with that. That is a very different kettle of fish. I find that exciting and disturbing in equal measure. Um, and the fact it's still alive, I find exciting and disturbing in equal measure. And the fact it's in this territory, Cornwall, that, as I say, has a strangeness to it. And, you know, and there are rumours that the, the psychics and the sensitive pick up that it was something to do with Atlantis. So that I don't, there seems to be a lot of circumstantial evidence, you know, to say that there's more than something going on with all of that. There's actually a transmission of a type of magical knowledge that people really shouldn't flirt flirt with and play around with. Um, regarding Wales, I mean, certainly most of the women I've met in Wales would like you to think they're a witch. Love, you are an old witch, believe me. Um, you know, I mean, Wales tends to be on its on its haunches or on the on the back rope. Normally about the the, uh, the Welsh language and the horrors that the English have inflicted on Wales to try and get rid of the Welsh language. Oh, those terrible people coming here and building holiday homes, you know, buy, buying up local property so no one can afford to get a decent place to live anymore. Um, you know, and they they're right, they have wonderful epithets to their names. You know, Jones. If, if someone's Jones and they've got a particular job, you know, or oh, Jones the station, you know, if he, if he works for the railways or something like that. So it, are you looking at witchcraft there despite the rumours? No, you're probably not. Um, you know, the, uh, um, <sighs> Scotland, I've heard rumours, I've had conversations. To me, it looks like, again, this sort of postmodern weird revival of dark arts i cannot see from the little i know about those things that there's anything that's been going on for hundreds of years and there's this gathering of warlocks and harlots i can't see it sorry cornwall i'm finished this bit john cornwall i do see it um and i don't want to study it and i don't want to get involved with it but i do want to alert everyone on this show including my dear anthroposophy friends that it's real and it's there, John. And of course, we know who is the key individual in Cornwall in recent years, now King of England. Yeah, Cornwall. Yes. Well, that's a that's a you know again the location of. Tintagel and, and that whole Arthurian mythos leads back to Cornwall. And, uh, but if you get into some of that, uh, The God of the Witches that was written by Margaret Worry in 1931 is one of the best sources on the subject, actually. She's an interesting individual, uh, Anglo-Indian Anglo uh, who was an associate of Flinders Petrie, the notable archaeologist, and she was a contributor in a great many works on ancient Egypt, uh, one of which is also published in 1931, The Egyptian Temple, which is, is a remarkable work, one of my favorite books on Egyptology of all time. And you can see the, the uh, study that she does of, of a Egyptian temple, although a late period temple, but uh, it's it's unbelievable because you have reproduced in there their version of, of the archaic mythos, and it's it's absolutely astounding. Uh, you know when you get into talking about wa uh, and all these and and the the primal feather, <laughs> and and it's it's a beautiful 
beautiful imagery that's laid out there. And uh, so, yeah, you can find her works. Uh, the Egyptian temple, I believe, is, is available on the archive.org website. Uh, and the God of the Witches floats around. So if you're interested in all that stuff, uh, by all means, look up uh, Margaret Murray. She's wonderful. And so here we go. We're right at the end of our episode. And once again, we haven't even scratched the surface. Now, I was pulling a face and slightly wincing because remember, the, the Cornish aren't entirely happy with the English. You wouldn't say down there King Arthur. What you would say is King Artor, A-R-T-O-R. And that again rings neo-pagan bells. Um, at the very least, that's one of those Cornish words that must somehow link with the concept of a bear. Um, and right, so the, the, the Great Dipper, the Seven Stars. But you're also linking with something, something like were bears, you know, the, uh, you're linking with uh, an, a, 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 a British king, but not an English king who was there and is there and somehow guards the territories. I mean, it's a very, you know, this convoluted mixture of materials that I'm interested from a safe dis interested in from a safe distance. Um, I, I do consider the, the depths of certain branches of knowledge, apart from the fact it would take too much time for a, for a mere cleric, as not the sort of things you dabble with in any way, shape or form. And, and that is one of them. Um, anyway, my friends, um, let me promise you that I sadly I will be getting my hair cut soon. Uh, my, I don't think I look like Benjamin Franklin anymore. I look like the wild man of Borneo. So I will be recovering my part of my original visage at some point. Um, uh, maybe it should be the other way around. I should have longer hair when, as the autumn gets it gets into middle ground. I don't know, but anyway, I've decided that. <coughs> so we're looking forward at that. We're looking forward to, of course, recovery of time, as I alluded to earlier. In Britain, soon the hour goes back. We gain an hour. We dance with piskies, if you're in that part of the world, the pixies, the fairies. We remember our ancestors. And we remember things we like doing, like this show. Um, for me, this isn't just a show. It's chatting with a friend, my dear friend John Barnwell. It's chatting to all of you. It's us sharing our insights together. It's us clearing away the blocks, maybe, that are holding us back from our, you know, the blocks in the path, stones, pebbles, things we can do without, that we need to work our way through as we approach the light. John. I would, John, I would appreciate it if you would turn on the closed captioning feature setting for these shows. Uh, I have to address that because uh, the dilemma is that I'm, I'm streaming into here from, from StreamYard. And so uh, if you want closed captions, uh, they will be available once it's uh, transcribed through uh, YouTube. And so you'll be able to have that. Uh, the text version for those of you that are outside the U.S. and maybe English isn't your first language. Back to you, David. Thank you. Well, you know, all I wanted to say was um, I quite like extempore prayer on this show. I don't like formal prayer on this show. You know, uh, why? Because it doesn't seem appropriate, although I do regard this as our little chapel, and, and quite, maybe quite rightly so. Um, as the light diminishes at this time of year externally, the ancient custom was to remember it shines ever more brightly internally. Um, we invite the dead, our loved ones, back to share time with us, that great miracle. We invite ourselves to share time with each other. And we invite us to spend time with ourselves. That's what this season is all about, the recovery of time and the strengthening of the heart as we approach the end of autumn and the beginning of winter. My friends, some of us call that divine light 
the Christ energy, the Christ principle, the Christ. Those of you who share that with me and John, and those of you who don't, let's take heart in that inner radiance as it burns ever more brightly during the failing light of this season, the failing external light. Be warmed in your purpose. Be calm and warmed in your spirit. Be sturdy as we walk through darker days into that eternal light, that glorious light awaiting us all at the end of time. May blessings and mercy be with all of you every hour, every day, until we all meet again next week. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor David, and thank you, everybody else, for showing up. For those of you that view it later on, uh, please share it, click like, and I look forward to seeing you all next week.